We're gonna. We talked yesterday about the. Um, let's see. Let me back up to see where we were. The last. Yeah. Does that sound better, Michael? Yeah, it seems to be fine. Okay. We ended last night with this statement that the scholars are saying, and that goes for Einstein. That goes for, you know, Carl Sagan. Obviously, we had a quote from him yesterday. But they're even the father of rocket science, uh, all the way back to Edmund Halley. It's been a very common understanding that the planet may have been visited you know, by beings from other planets. And it's completely um, understandable that that could happen. And Jack Barringer's quote that there's been 30, 300,000 documents, 300,000 texts still surviving that you know, talk about that, of the ones that um, still remain. And here from the book of Isaiah, we have these very enigmatic traits, uh, uh, tracts. You'd think that the compilers of the Bible would have done a better editing job since their job was to try and cover up information, and yet these kinds of incredible statements are there, which, you know, what do they mean, you know, coming from the end of heaven to destroy the whole land? I mean, these things need to be interpreted. And in the Revelations, of course, which is a fascinating document, it says, and the great dragon was cast down, that old serpent. All of these terminologies that we're getting, are, are they just the ramblings of some insane eccentric? Um, they certainly don't sound like theological language, really. They don't sound like real religious language. And people have often not paused to stop and think, what do these terms actually refer to? They don't give you footnotes, you know, in the Bible necessarily. They don't explain things. They have these, they'll explain, you know, the most bizarre things. They'll give you great details about this fig tree that was growing in the middle of Lebanon, you know, or the details of this well. You know, insignificant details are endlessly, you know, elaborated, and yet monumentally important things like, who's the dragon? Yeah, blank. You know? So, we pick up today and from here. The deluge was not a natural phenomena, I write in the book, but was caused inadvertently by alien beings from distant reaches who entered into our solar system between 50,000 and 30,000 years ago. So two things from this. One is that that's a pretty wild statement because again, even if you do, say you were a scientist, say you were a geologist, an anthropologist, a paleo, you know, paleologist, okay, what happens even in that field if you finally, after 20 years of study and, and, and head scratching, do accept in fact that the world has been visited by say a deluge? I mean, that's how unbelievably slow these people are. It takes them this amount of time to even get around the idea that maybe we did have a pole shift or something. Well then, imagine selling them the fact that, oh yeah, we did, but it was also caused by right, human, or let's say humanoid interaction. They're gonna go, come on, we've only we spent 200 years here just trying to get warmed up to the idea that the planet may have even had that, and now you're telling us it was man-made? Do us a favor. So that's the thing that needs to be proven. You can't just say things like that without proving it. And the other thing is, if you're familiar with Zachariah Sitchkin's work, you're gonna notice a difference in the dates. Zachariah Sitchkin pushes the visitation you know, back 400,000 years. He's very specific about that. And I tend to not agree with that. And the quick reason is, is because that date is not corroborated by any other miscellaneous legend from anywhere in the world. Zachariah uh, focuses almost entirely on the Babylonian Sumerian record and maybe only very briefly goes into everything else and practically neglects the Celtic and, and many others. I don't do that. What I try to do is take something I've read and then see how many other you know, people are corroborating and cross-referencing it. So even those dates may not be right, the ones I've written, but they seem to be more in line with what the geologists are now discovering about the Earth, and they certainly are more in line with what the other tribes are saying. Meaning that the 400,000 year date is artificially pushed back far, far too far. And I tend to think that, that there's something not accurate about that. These visitors were extremely scientifically advanced humanoid beings who came, who, that should be, who entered into our solar system after being forced to exit their own planet or planets. They had been expunged by opposition forces and were being pursued across the galaxy. Upon arrival, they set up an unmanned makeshift decoy center on the planet Tiamat, which once existed between Mars and Jupiter, but they actually took refuge on Earth. Tiamat was a vast ocean planet known from antiquity as the second sun. The second sun motif is replete in ancient mythology. It's not just coming from remote viewers and other channelers who've been receiving a lot of this information, but it's also in the records itself. Actually, it wasn't a sun. It was a vast planet. But because of its atmosphere, right, the actual sun's rays on, the, on Tiamat made it appear very resplendent. Tiamat was uh, called by various names. Tiamat is a Swedish name, and it means the goddess of the waters or the bitter waters. And it was also called Lucifer, by the way. That's where the word originally comes from. The sun of the morning meant the sun, or Tiamat, the second sun. Phaeton, 
Remember Phaeton, the hero in Greek myth who goes too close to the sun and falls down? That, wasn't a real, or, 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 that originally was not a story about the actual sun, it was again a mythology about Phaeton, about Tiamat. Because you can imagine that if, if for hundreds and thousands of years we've had a second sun up there, and it's not there now, but if we've had it, you would imagine that just like all the other planets, there's mythologies associated with it, and there are. But if that thing disappears and mankind forgets about it, then you can't account for all those mythologies suddenly. So what do you do? You shift the whole category over to the sun itself or one of the other planets that is there. Mistake. And then, you know, we've got to come along and go, wait a minute, that doesn't fit, put it back. It's an endless process of trying to extrapolate the mythologies then. But it was also called Marduk, Vulcan, Rahab, Typhon, Tistria, and Kingu. Don't worry about if you don't get all these notes because it's all in the book. And the revelation says, yes, there did fell a great star from heaven. They say star, planet, same thing. Chuck Meisler, he says, these asteroids are not ordinary pieces of rocks and clouds. Oh, by the way, when it was destroyed, you see, it's not there. The asteroid belt is its remains. And Chuck Meisler is saying, these asteroids are not ordinary pieces of rocks and clouds of dust that never quite coalesced to become a legitimate planet, which is the story that we get from the Orthodox. Another estimate is that the original planet may have been 15 times larger than the Earth. And that's exactly what they say. It was a very, very large planet. The rings of Saturn may have come into being because of these cosmic upheavals. Moreover, the added debris from Tiamat increased the weight of the Earth and slowed the rotation of the Earth, adding five and a quarter days to the year. <laughs> Alan and Dallaire, in a fantastic book called Cataclysm, they say, if we elevate the moon right, to planetary status, as the Sumerians appear to have done, then we have a total of 10 planets orbiting the sun today. On this basis, one planet is still missing from the earlier Sumerian total. Could there really have been another planet known to the Sumerians, as yet unknown to us and lost since their day? The fact that it was resplendent, it wasn't an actual sun, as I said, it was a planet, that is not as far-fetched as it sounds, because in fact, Venus, the morning star that's still there, is the second planet from the sun, and it is the third brightest object in the sky, so much so that it casts a distinct shadow on a moonless night. That is not as far-fetched as it sounds, because in fact, Venus, the morning star that's still there, is the second planet from the sun, and it is the third brightest object in the sky, so much so that it casts a distinct shadow on a moonless night.